Good evening, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. I'm Quentin Hardy, head of editorial at Google Cloud, and the moderator for tonight's program. Our speaker tonight is John Yu, who is here to discuss his new book, Striking Power, How Cyber, Robots, and Space Weapons Change the Rules for War. John has been a professor at Berkeley Law since 1993. In addition to this, he served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General under the George W. Bush administration, clerked for Supreme Ju Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and worked on complex issues of national security. Uh, John, thanks for joining us. This is a very intriguing book to me because on one level it is about these new technologies of war, and on a deeper level I think it's about the whole nature of warfare, nations at war, and the rule of law, the law of war. Um, I think that's a strange idea for some people. So why don't we just set that ground to begin with and talk about the laws of war. <clears throat> Thanks, Quentin. Thank you also to the Commonwealth Club for having us uh, be the inaugural program of this new beautiful building. I mean, this is an incredible building, and you're very lucky to, to have it, and I'm, I feel very fortunate that we're here uh, today. I will warn you, uh, I've had a long day. I gave a speech at Berkeley. Uh, this never happened to me, and someone had a stroke in the audience during <laughs> my speech. I'm sure that's not going to happen Something tonight. Something you said? But <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be less provocative than usual. Darn. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, as Quentin said, the book is about technology, but it's also got a deeper message about the laws of war, how nations fight, how they agree on uh, rules in the first place. And uh, we have a long-running discussion about what is international law, do nations follow it? But to the extent they do, it seems they follow it primarily when it comes to how they fight wars, where you are quite right, you would think that this would be uh, the area where they would follow law the least. Uh, Cic you know, Cicero has a famous comment that when wars start, the laws end. But actually, we argue that's not been the case. Uh, there's been a lot of principles throughout uh, uh, human history that have uh, that, have tr that have come forward in war and have limited how uh, harsh and difficult war can be. In an extreme way, there's sort of like statements about what we are not. We would not be the people who would do this. Mm -hmm. we, we, um, or we've stepped over that boundary and found something horrible. The, the great example would be the use of gas in World War I, which almost to a vanishing point didn't really be used in the war of World War II, instead it was used on the people mm -hmm. in the concentration camps. But there, for the, for the people contesting the battle, that just vanished. But then other more problematic technologies came about. Mm -hmm. um, but you seem to see the idea of the law of war under a peculiar kind of tension now. And we'll get to the technologies in a minute, but you also have an argument with things that happened in the 1970s around constraints placed on some nations. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> part of the story of the book is that the laws of war, like law domestically, is the product of uh, ideological combat. Uh, that there are countries, like there are groups in our own society that want to change the law to advance their own interests. And what we saw after World War II was uh, we saw the great decolonization of the world. And so many more nations came to exist, uh, and they sought to rewrite the rules of war to remove the advantages that the Western countries had had, which were primarily technolo technological in nature. And so one of the big changes occurred in 1977. Uh, there's a new Geneva Convention that was written called the Additional Protocol to the Geneva Convention uh, that sought to give uh, terrorists and freedom fighters the same protections as Western fighters. Uh, and for that reason, the United States actually refused to sign that treaty. We still are not a party to it. Uh, but that's an example of the kind of changes that were going on, and they were ideological in nature to try to use law to you know, rewrite the balance of power. Now, these, these non-state actors were to be given the same um, status as nations. Were they on a reciprocal, reciprocal level, expected to obey the rules of war? That's, that was the difficult thing, uh, I think, for the 
tree writers, and we've had ever since. Uh, and you can see it in the war on terror we have now. You can see it in the war the, between the British and the Irish and IRA, or you can see it in uh, the wars involving uh, Israel and Palestinians and Arab countries now, is even though you're going to have uh, different capabilities, different types of fighting, uh, do we re is everything supposed to be reciprocal? Do we require uh, those who fight against us to follow the same rules? And uh, our, our argument in the book is that I think actually the people who wrote the New Geneva Conventions tried to actually give the benefit of the doubt to the freedom fighter or the liberation, the non-state actors, to give them a kind of advantage in war, that, that we would not require them to same, the ex follow the exact same rules that we did. And then the point of the book, the reason we're talking about the book is that technology places even more pressure right. on that difference. Let's talk about some of those new technologies. You cite three in particular. So run them down in order of importance, if you will. Yes, yeah, so the, the, our main argument is that the changes in technology that we're seeing all around us in the economy, in daily life, uh, robotics, as we're seeing the emergence of self-driving cars, obviously the internet uh, information revolution, tech, uh, the uh, broad use of information and analysis, and then space. Uh, one thing that uh, is going on, uh, you see it in SpaceX, for example, is the cost of launching satellites has fallen by 90% in the last decade. The cost of space has really fallen. Just as those are causing lots of changes in our economy and society, which I think you, you, you at Google know, actually, I wish I knew as much as you did at Google about what's really going on. <laughs> but these are all going to affect uh, our militaries and our warfare too, warfare too. But with a big difference in that uh, our argument is that in the past, when new technology has come to war, it's had the effect of making war more destructive, uh, more harmful, and m less discriminate in the sense that civilians are the ones who are really suffering in war in the 20th century. Uh, new technologies, as far as we can tell, are going to have, in a way that they are also having the civilian economy, less harmful, more precise, less destructive, which has not happened really in human history before. Mm -hmm. But, um so space war and war by robot, or as we see them now, drones, and cyber war are sort of three aspects of warfare that you seem to think can be utilized or controlled by, largely by large nation state actors mm -hmm. to kind of restore a system of order in the world that's fragmenting right now under this turmoil of non-state actors that's been underway well since well before the 70s really uh, how would that take place how can they control this so our 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 concern is that uh, there are nations and governments and the United Nations for example and NGOs that are pressing for a ban on a lot of these technologies uh, you might have seen just two weeks ago Elon Musk and 100 tech CEOs called for a ban on the development of AI and robotics and warfare. Uh, the main argument is that uh, this is going to spread war too much. It's going to be too easy and cheap. Our argument in response is that the big problem, actually, that we're seeing now, and I think, uh, I think uh, we're s really seeing it come to uh, crucible in places like Iran and North Korea now, <coughs> is uh, you're seeing, I think, the threat of disorder is greater than the worry that uh, countries are going to go to war too easily. And so you're going to see things more like Syria happen, I'm afraid, where uh, the nations of the world s s take a hands-off attitude at first mm -hmm. and let these crises get worse. Or Rwanda's, where a very small detachment of Western troops could have stopped uh, the killing of 900,000 people. Uh, so our argument is that if there, are, there is a, a barrier or reluctance to nations like the United States and other nations from stepping up and trying to prevent things like the Syrian civil war, prevent things like Rwanda from happening, maybe these kind of technologies will make it easier to, uh, to stop those kinds of, or as you said, the, the, com the rise in disorder in the world. Let's spend a minute on drones because that seems to be sort of the one people identify most with mm -hmm. an extension of conventional war. Mm -hmm. What is it about drones people find 
objectionable? And how do you speak to that? So the, the arguments are, there are two kinds of arguments. One, uh, I think, is, is a legitimate argument, and one, I think, is a little bit uh, science fiction-y. If that's a, I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> um, so the, I think the legitimate argument is uh, drones uh, make it cheap and easy to use force. Mm. We don't have any of our own soldiers at risk. Uh, you know, we saw this particularly in the Obama administration. You can be so precise in the way you use drones. You don't really worry about collateral damage the way we used to because you can hit one building or even hit one person and you don't kill lost civilians nearby. You don't destroy lots of buildings. So it's very, the argument is it's just easy to press the button to use the drone all the time rather than turning to diplomacy or sanctions or something first. Uh, the, the broader argument that is made by people like Elon Musk or Stephen Hawking or Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple, is that this is putting us on the road to losing our control and independence as human beings. Skynet. Yeah, the, you know, that the robots are going to take over. Mm -hmm. they, they, they said these in these letters that the... Once we launch these weapons, once we launch artificial intelligence, we're no longer going to be able to control it. They're going to eventually take over our defense systems, and they're going to start making decisions, not human beings. That, I think, is uh, way far off, and, and I've not seen any proof that that would actually happen. But the argument that war becomes cheap and easy is, no. you know, that's undeniable. I think we saw that uh, for the last 10, 15 years, actually. With There's the also the peculiar argument that... Um well, the, there is a valid argument that the um, collateral damage is understated. And in fact, frequently, many people are killed because the targeting changes. You don't meet on the field of war, you target them at home. And that's, but that's part of the larger problem for many people, which is this is a form of assassination. This is not a form of war. Mm -hmm. Is that a legitimate objection? And how does war differ from assassination anyway? Wasn't World War II a large effort to kill one man in Berlin? Yeah, no, it, the, 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 the curious thing about the assassination argument is that if it were correct, then it would force you instead to use much more destructive weapons to try to achieve the same goal. So if it is a legitimate to try to target Osama bin Laden and you're using drones or other high-tech weapons to do it, uh, why is it uh, more, more immoral or more illegal to use a drone to launch a missile to try to hit that one rather than what we would have done in you know, pre-drone days, which is launched a bombing run with manned bombers and destroyed a lot more buildings. Or, Carpet you know, bomb. So it's actually the precision of it that makes people uh, recoil at some level, but it's the precision that actually is making casualties in war drop. This is one of the interesting um, aspects of warfare in the last 50 or 60 years, really. Um, World War II was sort of the greatest and most tragic expression of Napoleonic style war. Big armies facing each other off with, as you note, this acceleration in the number killed. And it just stopped working around the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And we tend, you know, we, we've been in a 64 year truce with the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. We haven't ever ended that war. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we don't fight to take territory as much as sort of own an argument or control economic assets. It's a new form of coercion that's taking mm -hmm. place. And a strange but quite hopeful development actually is we value individual lives so much more than we used to as well, except at least the visible ones. Mm -hmm. The invisible ones seem to go in huge numbers. But if you look at um, in Vietnam, we lost 220 Americans a week. Can you imagine that taking place now? At least on the U.S. side, there's so little appetite for a loss of life. Well, probably taking fewer lives on the other side, but the numbers get very squishy. And this feathers into another element of this that you talk about, which are the three other types of new technology that are um, in-state and non-state actors' hands, which are biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons, um, which you also see affecting war. Well, well let, me, let me say, I hadn't thought of it quite the way you just put it, but that's, I, 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 I agree with that. It's an interesting way to look at it, which is, um, uh, in a way, uh, we're not fighting wars like World War I, World War II, and Napoleonic Wars to just completely win anymore. We're trying to uh, manage problems in the world. And it so, underlines the media power. Yeah that we, every soldier who falls has a backstory now. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that at Normandy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so this is, this is how the technologies, I think, then, um, how I would say they uh, interact with your point, which is that if we're in a world, take North Korea, we're stuck uh, between essentially trying to bribe him, uh, bribe, not him, the North Korean regime, or think about uh, launching a war. Uh, you know, the President Trump has, you know, was just tweeting, you know, Rex Tillerson, why are you wasting your time on negotiations? Uh, after he sent them there for negotiations. So uh, it's an interesting part. Well, that was strategy. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's like uh, they're playing bad cop and bad cop. <laughs> or, <laughs> Rex Tillerson, why didn't you yeah. tell me you were negotiating with North yeah. Korea is the other premise of that, which is an interesting thought. But I think, uh, you know, in our, in our policy, it's a bipartisan problem, right? Presidents for, you know, since the first Clinton term have not solved this problem. But I think that's because we, we are stuck between this total war, this old World War II, Korean War view, or nothing. And the hope, I think, is that technologies will provide ways of pressuring other countries that don't force us to have to just go to war. If you have different ways of pressuring other nations, hopefully that's going to head off something like a rush to an absolute war like in North Korea. And that is the hazard. I, you, know, you seem to indicate, and I, obviously, the three fearsome technologies, if you will, chemical, um, nuclear, and biological, are very anarchic forms of violence. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're positing that the cyber and space and robotic ones are more precise, if mm -hmm. you will. And that's the concern. Yeah, if you think about nuclear weapons, they are the most indiscriminate form of weapon. They don't discriminate between combatants and civilians. They just... <clears throat> destroy whole cities, right? They're, uh, so they're, they're a form of the old technology and the, the way warfare and weapons had been advancing was in that direction. And then these new weapons really, I think, turn it around in a different direction. Well, it's precision. That was a question I had reading the book. You said that the, perhaps these three can be used to coerce mm -hmm. so that people don't use the deadly anarchic ones. Yeah. What's the scenario where that happens? So take uh, North Korea. I think that's the hardest uh, foreign policy problem we have right now. So you could say, look, at one level, when it comes time to defense, high-speed computing, robotics, space platforms could allow us to build a more complete missile defense system that would be more in the region. Mm -hmm. If you think about our missile defense system now, it's, a, it's the most primitive one you could design. It's designed to shoot missiles down as they're in their, ter and it's called a terminal phase for a reason. It's when the <clears throat> missiles have left space and they're rushing to the yes, targets. Yes, they're, they're doing their ballistic yeah. work, they're just falling. And you really are trying to shoot a bullet with a bullet. It's incredible mm -hmm. that we can even make contact. Where you want to have missile defense work is when the missiles are in their, what's called their boost phase, when they're first taking off. That's mm -hmm. the easiest time to strike them. Uh, if you could use drones and space and, and sea-based weapons, we've got the fleet in this week. These ships could deploy these kinds of systems and station a missile defense around North Korea just to shoot down the missiles, not invade North Korea, not bomb anyone in North Korea, but shoot down missiles at the easiest time to shoot them down. That's the way new technology can contribute to some kind of intermediate step between nothing and full war. Mm -hmm. And then another thing, you know, Google or cyber, uh, you know, from your Google experience, there are cyber weapons. You know, North Korea is one of the most isolated regimes in the world. But we just saw a story today. They're still trying to sell things. They're still trying to buy and sell in the international economy. And so why can't we use cyber to freeze all assets of any company doing business with North Korea, freeze all the money of all the reg regime members, just make life difficult? And that's what we're trying to get back to is force was not about waging war and wiping out other countries. It was about trying to pressure them to change their policies in mm -hmm. a graduated way. This comes to a head. Oh, thank you. This comes to a head in the last page where you say, referring to MacArthur taking the surrender of Japan in 1945, since 1945, no American war has ended with a formal surrender ceremony, let alone a, cer a ceremony on a U.S. warship near the enemy capital. The more pressing question is whether the new weapons can compel rogue actors to stop their worst practices. And this, I think, gets to the, the, the crux of things, which is... Um, can the nation states continue to sort order in the world, or are we headed to something more anarchical? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that is the deeper challenge, and we are, when you see things like Assyria, North Korea, those are all just 
manifestations of this bigger trend. Or non-state actors yeah, like or, ISIS or Al Qaeda or Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. go out the list. Yeah, and, and so I th you know, my worry is that uh, the kind of order we have enjoyed since the end of World War II that has led to enormous prosperity for us and our allies is slipping away. And uh, if we are going to pursue a more isolationist foreign policy with a desire to pull back our footprint from the world, it's going to get worse. It's going to accelerate. So if there are ways for the United States to still maintain its influence by using technology, even without risking casualties, I think we should all be for it. And it may not work. I mean, I'm more of an optimist. You might be yeah. more of a pessimist that this is just going to happen no matter what we do. I think do. Your, your final argument is it may <laughs> not work, but what else have you got? Yeah, what else can we try? Yeah. Um, not to get too pessimistic about that, but <laughs> part of the hazard is now the technologies and the kind of actors we're dealing with on the international stage have really muddied things to a point where it's hard to parse and discern where a nation state begins and ends and criminal or non-state actors take, take forth. Um, Russian hackers affecting the US election. Or if, if a, um, imagine a ransomware attack from a Chinese military university that injures the financial system. Is that a criminal act? Is that mm -hmm. university hacking? Is that the Chinese military by proxy? How do we sort where things begin and end the way we used to? So I, I completely agree those are all problems we're confronting right now right. for the last year or two. Uh, and we have not figured them out. Our, I think in Washington and our, and our other intellectual leaders are all very confused about how to treat something like uh, a hacking attack from a state-sponsored organization or even just a terrorist group? Is it an act of war? Is it a crime? I think for the last few years, uh, let me back up. Uh, in the book, we argue why we've had success in things like uh, weapons of mass destruction technology so far was deterrence. Uh, and you see deterrence when offense is cheap and defense is expensive. Uh, so nuclear weapons are a great example. It's very easy and cheap to make nuclear weapons, almost impossible to construct a defense. Yet we lived with the Soviet Union for 50 years without having a nuclear exchange because of deterrence. I think that's what the solution is going to be to these vulnerabilities you just mentioned. The two technologies give us some weapons, but they also make us extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The only way I think to stop it is to construct a system of deterrence because playing defense is so much more expensive than launching thousands of right, cyber attacks, which well, are very another cheap and easy. Another aspect of this um, would be the nation state becoming much more of an active um, agent of surveillance on its own population and on populations in movement elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You see that happening? I mean, that's clearly going on now. Uh, it's, I, it's interesting. I mean, I think tech, the private companies are way ahead of what governments can do. No offense to Google, but I think like, I mean, Google, I'm sure can do much more than the United States government can in terms of what knowledge it has. And, but, we want you we to. Sell we sell kayaks. No, no, that's what I mean. We give Come it. Come on. No, no, we voluntarily give it to you. We that's help other people sell kayaks. We don't even own kayaks. Come on. No, no, I, no, I agree. This is the amazing thing is we willingly give it to the corporations, and that's fine. That's On our the enterprise choice. side where I work, we don't keep your data. Yeah. Uh, would you comment on the presumed sonic attack on our embassy in Havana? How does that stand as an oh, act of belligerence? That's very uh, interesting. I mean, we're not... As far as I know, we're not really sure what it is. I mean, it's well, we're not talking about yeah, what it is because yeah, that sounds awkward. like it is a, you know, the Cuban government is harassing our embassy officials, and uh, I think again, it's a, I think it's a, a deterrent issue. I think the United States has to do something back to Cubans, uh, to the Cuban mission in the United States or the Cuban embassy in the United States, or. Um, you know, expel the standard quid pro quo. Yeah, because I don't. I, I mean, I don't. I think that is that's. The, but that's the point of the book is that's really what seems to work when nation mm -hmm. states do things like this to each other, is reciprocity. Yeah, deterrence. seek a proportionate, and rather than escalate. Like I would, you know, we've we've normalized relation uh, again normalization, relations with Cuba. I think this is not something at the level where we should just cut off diplomatic relations. We've already crossed that line, but. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that if the Cuban government is using sonic weapons against our embassy uh, employees and officials, then we ought to kick <clears throat> out all the members of the Cuban embassy in the United States. 
it's a tough prove. That's the problem. And that's frequently a problem with cyber as well. And as far as that's concerned, another question. When or how do you see a Geneva Convention on Cyber War coming about? This is a very interesting question. Uh, there are a number of experts who've actually drafted uh, a, a Geneva Convention on cyber. Mm -hmm. And they've gone through, they, they've created a manual. It's called the Talon Manual because it was written in Talon, Estonia uh, by a bunch of experts from law all around. Our, our argument, though, is that that's not going to work uh, because it's too early in the development and use of these weapons. Actually, uh, I think we, uh, we compare it to World War I. So you might remember in World War I uh, was really the uh, first major war that saw the use of mass production economic techniques in wartime. You draft armies, cheap mass-produced weapons. You saw the emergence of submarines, uh, aerial bombing, long-range artillery, tanks eventually. Um, there were all kinds of efforts right away at the beginning to try to pass laws to regulate all these weapons. Uh, they all failed because you don't know enough about them in the beginning to tell, so for example, some countries will believe that they will have an advantage from these weapons, like I would say China and Russia are rapidly accelerating in these areas because they want to leapfrog us. They think it's a way to neutralize our uh, enormous conventional superiority. Uh, they won't sign, if you ever have a situation, like you're not going to have any kind of agreement signed. But there are, go ahead. I was just say there, there will be a time, like with nuclear weapons, right? There were no nuclear weapons treaties until the 70s, really. Then you saw an uh, agreement to freeze the arsenals and then to reduce them. That's when there was a rough balance of equality between all the players. And right now, no one knows whether that's, when that happens, that's when you'll see, I think, a right. code of conduct that will regulate cyber. Well, and unfortunately, the, um, the above ground treaty came about a little bit earlier. And it really had a lot to do with the fact that we had a uh, hydrogen bomb test that was three times larger than we expected and released an enormous amount of radiation. It was a U.S. move that resulted in a U.S.-Russia agreement. Um, let's hope it isn't some terrible accident like that that causes it. Before that, you could take some steps. As you were saying in your book, um, there seems to be some agreement that the uh, limitations... Debil deliberate killing of civilians is wrong, though infrastructure and property seem to be okay. A cyber attack, say, that affected vital civilian infrastructure, the water system. Since I think this is a, a gruesome but true conversation throughout history. This is oh, yeah. simply a reality. I think uh, the problem is, again, that we are fighting, as you brought up in the beginning, this idea that you know, the warfare is now coming into the hands of non-nation states, and they're, you know, they're going to be able to access a lot of these technologies too and use them. Uh, do we really think that the criminal justice system is capable of handling something like an ISIS or an Al-Qaeda when oh. it's a non-state actor that has a lot of the elements of an of organized crime group? You're likely to create a, a police system much more like a military, which to some extent has happened since 9-11. Yeah, I mean, the hope is that if you stop it from coming here, you don't have to engage in a lot of things that our European counterparts do. I mean, if you walk around airports or train stations in Europe, you will see, you know, military troops patrolling. Mm -hmm. And they have European governments use far more intrusive surveillance and police powers than we would tolerate here because it's already there. And right. And they, and they have a history of it, too, from previous terrorist uh, wars. You know, we, I think so far we haven't had to go as far as Europe, and I, I hope we don't have to. But you're right, if ISIS and uh, if people worry that if ISIS loses its territory in Iraq and Syria, all those people are going to try to infiltrate into the West, then, then you're right, then you're going to have that concern. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a question a little bit away from the topic of the book, but in the wake of... Um, the events in Las Vegas today, I will allow. What are the pros and cons of gun control? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, that's not in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, it's interesting. I mean, I think if it were not for the Second Amendment, we would probably have much broader gun control here than we do already. So as you know, the Second Amendment to the Constitution says... Uh, uh, protects the right to bear arms, although it's interesting 
the Supreme Court did not identify that as an indi individual right until about less than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so until then, no one was sure whether gun control uh, regulations and restrictions, were how whether they were constitutional. So at the same time, the Supreme Court upheld the individual right to bear arms. It also said that right is subject to reasonable regulation. Uh, we don't know what reasonable regulation means yet uh, at the Supreme Court level. They've not taken another case. But for example, the, all the lower courts have upheld a ban on, for example, the weapon used, unfortunately, yesterday, an automatic weapon. Mm -hmm. So the courts have said if the government wants to, the government's not saying you can't have any guns, but it's saying you can't have fully repeating automatic rifles. The, most of the courts have upheld that. Most of the courts have upheld uh, that you can withhold the right to bear arms from uh, people of mental illness or are felons, um, that, you, that you can restrict the kinds of weapons as long as you don't take away fully the right to uh, bear arms. I think the important question that we should examine when we make these decisions is what effect do these regulations actually have on crime rates and the use of guns? And I, I, there is a huge debate in the economics literature about exactly this question. Is there any kind of relationship between the assault weapon ban and the drop in crime that we have seen in the last 20, 25 years or, or not? Uh, is there, are guns more widely available now than they used to be, and are they being used more often in crimes? Do that examples think, like Australia, where they made people turn in their guns and there have been yeah. far fewer shootings, yeah. shed light on the situation in the United States? Yeah, because that would be important to take into account when you decide whether something, something's reasonable. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think, I don't, I'm not, but the court and the Constitution don't say that the right to own uh, guns is absolute free of all regulation. Actually, I, no uh, right is absolutely free of regulation. Even freedom of speech is mm -hmm. subject to t reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. So mm -hmm. someone shouldn't be allowed to interrupt you when you're giving a speech. <laughs> and yet, and it yet happens. <laughs> it happens sometimes three times in a session. Maybe four. It's a couple up now that I don't trust still. Um, <clears throat> Is it easy or difficult for nations to know the, nif the difference between wartime and peacetime in the 21st century? That's a great question. That's it goes to this question. point we were uh, going back to uh, uh, earlier. Uh, let me say that one of the projects of the post-1945 world was the idea that there should be a clear dividing line between what's war and what was peace, and that you would make war very difficult to enter and to wage in the hopes that you just wouldn't have very much of it. The sad, unfortunate thing is that since World War II, actually uh, the number of people dying in wars uh, has gone up if, they are, if you count civilians. Mm. If, you combat, if you count combatants, soldiers, actually ca casualties in war have really fallen. Uh, there, uh, this fellow Steven Pinker wrote this, wrote this book claiming that war is declining. Uh, he, you know, he has a psychological reason why. Uh, who knows whether he's right or not, but the, the empirical data is true. Uh, the casualties in war have dropped tremendously in the last 100 years. It's, an, it's incredible, actually, several orders of magnitude. But the people dying in wars who are civilians has gone way up. I think the last figure I saw is 90% of all casualties in war are now civilian deaths. This gets back to my point about visible versus invisible mm -hmm. deaths in war. The soldiers are highly visible. Um, the greatest loss of life in our time was the Congo Wars. Yeah, the Congo War. And those were largely people, civilians, driven into the jungle and never seen again. They probably died of disease or malnutrition. No one knows. It's an extremely cruel, awful, and inadvertent loss of life in the millions. So, but, but no one could see them. So, But also part of the work is that if we do try to have this clear dividing line between war and peace, and we make it difficult for nations to use force. They are going to be reluctant to use force in places like Congo, Syria, Rwanda. And also, people are going to be more visible. Civilians yeah. will be more visible in the future. Mm -hmm. and that may change the tenor of that kind of thing. Maybe. I Call mean, for more intervention. Yeah. I mean, uh, so <clears throat> if you want the United States to intervene more to try to stop these things, then you're going to see more of a blurred line between what's war and peace. There's going to be a lot more different stages of... Uh, the status between the United States and these other and these other countries in these situations, and 
I guess the argument with the new technology is that you want to align, you know, make available lots more options to countries to try to put a stop to these things so that they don't get worse and so that you don't see genocides like this, particularly in places like Africa. Mm -hmm. um, what is the biggest threat to U.S. national security today and how should the U.S. respond? Uh, so I, I would say the most, the most imminent threat has got to be North Korea. Yes. I mean, you have a, a regime that ha control, actually now has, uh, uh, seems to have tested a hydrogen weapon, and it has successfully shown it has the technology to reach the, most of the continental United States with uh, you know, ICBMs. Uh, I, I, I mean, the other threats that might come from places like Iran or Syria are, are just you know, farther down the road than North Korea. Uh, I, I, th I worry that we are, again, putting ourselves in between uh, trying to figure out some kind of system of appeasement or contemplating a military strike on North Korea, which would kill... What's the third yeah. way? Well, this is my point. It's like things in between. Yeah. Using these kinds of weapons is the... Is the other, it's, uh, it is, unfortunately, something like what we dealt with with the Soviet Union. It's going to be persistent unending and it's going to be a series of trying to pressure them and stop them from pursuing this course. This underlines the idea of the rise of great powers as surveillance states because you cut off North Korea's economic lifeline by spotting every bit of foreign trade. Mm -hmm. And the, the administration has been doing that by identifying trade that the nations, other nations themselves didn't even know they were having with North Korea in the millions of dollars, not huge sums, so they miss them. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. spy services of one form or other are identifying these at a much more granular level. You can love or hate that idea because in the abstract it means surveillance is going to be a very, very important part of being a great power. Oh, yeah. Again, like we see the, the collection of vast amounts of data and its analysis domestically. It's also happening in war. But hopefully in this in this case in a positive direction, which is again to, tra to track down money flow. Even North Korea, which is one of the most isolated countries in the world, still depends on trade for a lot of the scientific equipment they're using. A lot of the advances they've made have been because of technology and information they brought from outside. Hopefully, again, it's about persuading the regime to stop its course, or it may be not uh, Kim Jong-un, but the people around him, you know, the regime that supports him. That's something that used to happen in the 19th century all the time, and I think that's what we're going to have to return to. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience. Um, can you speak to the EMP threat to the U.S., electromagnetic pulses, yeah. knocking out huge amounts of the infrastructure? Yeah, this is, uh, you probably know, this is one of the most severe threats to American national security. It's um, something actually the North Koreans have just recently threatened against us. An EMP blast is... God, they uh, just don't stop. <laughs> they, you know, they, they think everything. They, it's, a, it's basically exploding a nuclear weapon high up in the atmosphere, which would not uh, directly kill any people on the ground, but would send out a uh, blast of radiation that would effectively... Uh, short circuit of fry most electronics and most electrical systems. So I think this would primarily be aimed at civilians because I expect our government has actually hardened a lot of the systems that are important for national defense. But think about what would happen to all of us if uh, all of the electricity on the West Coast was suddenly out of commission and our access to, th you know, not just some, think of everything at transistors and you won't be able to start cars. You know, the water systems would be shut down. Most, most things of modern life would shut down, uh, and it would take months to replace it, or maybe longer than months. So that is a severe, I think, a severe threat to our national security. The only way to stop it is with missile defense. I mean, there's no shield that we can build that would protect civilians from the EMP blast. Again, it's a limited... It's a you would reg we would regard that as an instrument of anarchic violence. Oh yeah, that would be a you know, clearly an act of a clearly an act of war, and it's really again it's designed to to attack civilian life, not really to hit military targets. We're mostly going to be hardened. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience. Um, I am not familiar with this, so I may mispronounce it. Since the Kell Kellogg Ryland Treaty in the 1920s, all treaties uh, outlawing war and certain weapons have been futile. 
why even have them? <laughs> uh, so you're, you mean the Kellogg Briand Pact? Excuse me. Which? <laughs> Thank you. The Kellogg Briand Pact. Uh, some people, there's a new book out that uh, finds it quite hopeful. It's also often used as an example of how uh, utopian international politicians can sometimes be, but the Kellogg Brown Pact of 1924 uh, banned war, if you didn't know it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, had all, it did almost no good. Um, but there, uh, it, you, know, it was, uh, you know, it was made a mockery of in the 30s and 40s, of course. Um, However, there are examples of nations cooperating to limit war. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, bi biological weapons have not been used, and chemical weapons have not been used by the great powers against each other since World War I. Countries have used them against their own citizens, as we've seen in Syria. But countries have not used them against each other since World War I. Nuclear weapons have not been used since right, the end of World War II. So those are examples where countries have cooperated successfully. Um, again, they, I think it would, but it's, it's sometimes people who believe in the Kellogg-Brown Pact and that movement think that right, international law can just ban a certain kind of weapon. But I think the important thing is to identify the conditions, to study those past cases and learn from what condition, what the conditions were they existed that allowed those kinds of cooperation to occur and then ask, what would we need to see today to be able to say let's have there'll be cooperation robotics or AI or space space weapons is a good example too I should have mentioned that uh, there is a something called the outer space treaty which does successfully ban uh, the stationing of weapons of mass destruction in space and no nation has violated uh, that ban since the signing of the treaty in 1967 because no one lost or gained an advantage from it the powers were mostly in balance uh, on that. Notice they didn't ban weapons of mass destruction passing through space. So obviously ICBMs can carry nuclear weapons through space and that's not a violation of the, of the treaty. So you have to, I, I think if you wanna have a hopeful story about things like the Kellogg-Brion Pact, you, I think you have to look for situations where there are a rough parity of, uh, of power between countries and that you're going to see cooperation because no one really wins or loses out of the pact. Mm -hmm. um, would developing new weapons, are we in a new kind of arms race mm -hmm. around these new types of weapons? Yeah. And would you care to handicap how the U.S. is doing? <laughs> so you know, there, it's undeniable that we're in an arms race. I mean, if we didn't do anything in these weapons areas, China and Russia will. A again, uh, China and Russia are pouring enormous amounts of their research and development money into these kinds of weapons and not into conventional weapons. It's interesting. We see them, we posit both of them in competition with us. Are they competing with each other oh, yeah. as well? Yeah, they're competing are with they, each other Are too. they hitting each other? And they, uh, they don't fully try. I mean, they remember they fought a war <laughs> against each other in the they late They asked 60s. Henry Kissinger yeah. for permission about a <laughs> nuclear attack. Yeah, so they are, uh, they are not inherently peaceful towards each other. Uh, nor is, I think, China inherently a peaceful country. Uh, if you look at the historical record, the, since the Communist Party has been in charge with China, they've basically attacked almost every country next to it over time. So we are in a, an arms race, yeah, not just, just with those two, but all these non-state actors and freelance hackers. I, 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 again, it's, it's a cheap and easy way to try to equalize uh, your military arsenal with the United States. How are we doing? Or do we even know how we're doing? So my uh, impression after doing the research for this book is that we are quite significantly ahead, actually, in, I'll say uh, more. in cyber and robotics. <laughs> well, th think about, uh, I think a, a lot of this, I, I think we tend to exaggerate how good government just is at all this stuff. I think a lot of it piggybacks on the advancements in the private sector, as we've seen in other past military uh, revolutions. There, is there any great internet company in Europe? I mean, there is a, almost all the great innovation is occurring in the United States, and that is much to the benefit of our security as well as to commercial enterprise. Uh, so for now, as long as that stays true, we are you know, taking advantage of that. But you know, you, 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 we were discussing earlier, China is certainly rising, and they are developing a lot of these technologies too in their commercial sector as mm -hmm. well. And that means they're, they are going to catch up on the military dimension as well. Russia, I don't think, is as serious a long-term 
uh, challenge because I think their economy just can't support this kind of competition, despite the fact they have a lot of great mathematicians and computer scientists. Uh, I think uh, this is an area where immigration reform could really help. We could invite them all to move to the United States. Mm -hmm. And yet their involvement in the U.S. election is probably the most visible. Um, do we qualify that as a cyber attack at this point? I, I think it's a, it again goes to the point you were making earlier that uh, these new weapons and new technologies, they give us advantages, but they open up a lot of vulnerabilities too. Uh, not just by other countries, but other organizations. You want to discuss the manipulation of media power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a, a first class example of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, there is I, no doubt, I, I think everyone agrees that Russia tried to interfere in our elections using cyber techniques. Whether they succeeded or not is the big question, but they certainly wanted to. Uh, and it doesn't even need to be that they wanted Donald Trump to win yeah, or not. not. They sure. just wanted to. I'm not sure whether they succeeded is the yeah. question. They tried to do it. Yeah, is the they question. tried. Yeah, and they that's uh, settled. They wanted to undermine American faith in our democratic political process, which may right be now. the big game here. Yeah. More than any winner or loser, cynicism about democracy mm -hmm. and the outcome of an election would be of an enormous strategic benefit mm -hmm. to the Russians. Mm -hmm. And whether, I, you know, to call that war and to call what they did uh, an attack. PSYOPs. So, no, I, so I would say uh, we, should, we should dispense with those kind of labels and we should just recognize the Russians are trying to coerce us and they're trying to pressure us uh, <clears throat> in ways that may fall short of what we call war or not. We shouldn't handicap ourselves by saying, well, we're only going to respond to you if you reach a certain level and then we're going to call it a war and then we're going to respond. Instead, I think we should be matching them now, that doesn't mean we should try to convince the Russians they didn't elect Putin, because that's not going to really work as a deterrent. I think they're cynical about democracy <laughs> right. already. We're not going to make a lot of ground but there. But the thing that these, you know, cyber, I think, in particular, gives you the ability to do is to inflict a cost on the Russian economy in some way that we think is comparable to what they've done to us. Well, we already have done, um, if the press reports are to be believed, and you seem to credit them, that um, the Stuxnet virus... Mm -hmm. um, quite significantly harming Iran's nuclear program, appeared to perhaps cause a change in behavior around the way they were treating nuclear development as well, which may be the most successful cyber attack of all that the U.S. has done. Yeah, so I mean, just and one point about it is that uh, I, I was trying to, I forgot to make it earlier, is that these kinds of weapons, when they're at that level of sophistication, like a Stuxnet virus, it is as if you had to build a whole weapons lab. It's not like some guy can take, come, some hacker can come along, get a college degree in computer science and pull things off the shelf and create a Stuxnet virus. The, those kinds of uh, cyber attacks really require the resources of a nation state, uh, the money, resources, and sophistication. And so uh, when we do suffer these kinds of, you mentioned, yes, there's one feature of cyber attacks is that they're difficult to attribute which is the fancy phrase computer scientists use. But we know when we suffer these kinds of attacks, if they break into certain kinds of systems, only one or a few countries are capable of carrying it out. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I say we should respond in kind. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we should use bombs or use kinetic weapons. We should use cyber weapons too. I, and I think we have been restraining ourselves. Stuxnet's a good example. We used it against Iran. But I don't think, at least publicly, there's any claim that we've used something similar against Russia and China, even though they've really been eating our lunch and the cyber. I mean, we've been having a low intensity cyber war with Russia and China for several years now. Mm -hmm. And this is another aspect that bears examination. You, traditional state violence, the use of the military, is highly transparent. We announce we're sending a carrier into the Gulf. We fly jets. We, it's on the evening news. This is closer to you know, what Winston Churchill called that long twilight war. Does it continue that way? Does this just sort of exist below the surface and the civilians don't hear or know very much about it? And is that healthy in a democracy? I, 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 th I think you make two really good points. I think that uh, if you turn more to cyber weapons and robotics, you're going to see more persistent conflict at a lower level, just as we've seen with the drone conflicts that we've been waging against Al-Qaeda or ISIS, you see far less of it. It's less destructive, but it's more it lasts longer. The conflict is not ending. 
so, you know, suddenly. As I said, there, we're not having a signing ceremony on the USS Missouri at the mm -hmm. end of a war. Uh, it's almost like war is a regulatory, you're regulating a problem. You're not seeking absolute victory, like MacArthur would say we should. So if that's the case, the benefit is you have less death, less destruction, less mobilization of an economy. The downside is, as you said, you have to have uh, the patience and you, you have to worry about whether a democracy can carry out a conflict for that long. I, I, will, uh, I don't think we directly address this as a book, but I'll remind you, at the, when the Cold War started, there were all kinds of people who thought that the United States would have to become an almost an authoritarian state in order to successfully compete with the Soviet Union for 50 or 100 years. Um, and there was a very famous book by one of the leading political scientists of the day, and it was called Garrison State. And it was an argument that the United States would become a garrison country because that was the only way to successfully compete with this. It didn't turn out that way. Actually, if you think about the period since World War II, this was, I would say, that one of the greatest periods of flourishing of civil liberties in our country's history. At the same time that we were also waging, as you said, a long-run, non-transparent, low-intensity conflict with the Soviets all around the world. And so that, so I, I mean, it, it seems like a trade-off that we assume that in order to fight these wars, we have to give up a lot of civil liberties at the same time. But actually, I think the record of the Cold War is quite the opposite, and it may be true with technology, that we may, I think we're living through an enormous expansion of free speech. I mean, remember in the old days, there were three channels. You mean in the control. past half hour. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is free. If they had to pay for it, they wouldn't be able to do it so much. But, no, sorry. John. <laughs> no, so my, my main point is that there used to be these, if you wanted to express your view and write an opinion piece, there were only a few TV channels and a few newspapers that controlled all right where these things came out. And now because of Google and Facebook and you know, Apple and Amazon, there are numerous channels for people to express themselves and conduct. I think this is incredible. At the same time, we're having this worry, as you mm -hmm. say, that the necessities of these wars are going to require us to increase the powers of the government. Now, this is a, um, you're, you're a professor of law at Berkeley, and this book does call for a good look at a lot of areas in Washington and in defense. So you must have researched a lot of things that surprised you doing this. Um, is that scary? Is that, um, does it make you more positive or negative? Uh, actually, of the things I studied, the thing that surprised me the most was robotics. I think there are incredible strides being made in robotics. And uh, we are seeing them in the civilian economy I think they're, you're going to see them faster in the civilian economy and domestic, but the technology is the same. So that's one thing uh, really was surprising to me how, uh, you know, we're all f obsessed with the self-driving car, but think about medicine. I think you're seeing huge changes in medicine from uh, robotics and big data. So uh, diagnosis, diagnoses of people's problems can be done by doctors all over the world now from any location. Uh, very delicate surgeries are being automated. Uh, you know, I talked to uh, someone who works in this field, and she said, if you had a delicate eye surgery, would you rather be operated on by a human doctor who might not have gotten enough sleep and might have been fighting with his or her spouse and, uh, you know, drove their car too fast to work that morning, or would you rather have a robotic surgeon do the surgery? I think That can be it. hacked. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to want to hack your eye surgery? <laughs> Except a lot of weird, malevolent <laughs> people out there. But the, the, the point is that the, the, I you're going to see point. this rollout's going to happen a lot. I was really struck. And if you have cloud happened. security, <laughs> this will not happen as readily. The security standards are going to change. I, the thing is, probably, but in warfare, that the change you will see will be uh, so far. Drones, in a way, are misleading because we think of robots as just re replacing human beings, but everything else will kind of look the same. So, a drone kind of looks like a normal aircraft, and so we imagine there'll be drone tanks. Well, drone augmented ships. soldiers don't. Yeah. No, but I think actually they'll be quite diverse. What, you, uh, what you're going to see are things that look more like Amazon delivery drones are going to be the weapons of the future. You're going to have uh, not a gigantic drone firing missiles. You're going to have things that look like very large birds or insects, and they're just going to swarm targets and crash into them. 
that's the future of robotics. But it's, again, it's all harnessed and linked to the changes that are going on in the civilian economy. Mm -hmm. I think I'm pretty close to our last question. I wanted to ask you um, about writing this book, about the reception you've had, but in light of the fact that the discussion has been interrupted, I did want to ask, that's not the first time that's happened to you speaking publicly. Um, what has your experience of all this been like? All this, Both in doing yeah. this mm. book and in the past 15 years since you were involved mm. in um, writing the memos justifying the policies ah. of the Bush administration? So, so uh, protesting doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, I've been a professor at Berkeley for more than 20 years, and it wouldn't be spring if there weren't a little tear gas in the air and some rioting. <laughs> well, that's just a light like, way to put it. But, <laughs> it's know. just like protesting is just like in every present feature of being a professor. Look, look, I'm from the East Coast. This was very shocking to me when I first showed up, how much of it goes on all the time, how much energy and resources people pour uh, into it, but at the yes, same but time, these I, kind of protests no, but I look, weigh on you. They, have you reflected on that part of your life and thought of re no, they, your decision? No, they don't, because uh, this is where this is the optimistic side of me. Is uh, you know, I um, I'm an immigrant from uh, Korea, and if things had turned out a little differently, I would either be building nuclear missiles or growing rice in a patty. So I think I'm really damn lucky to be here. Credit, I still can't believe that I got hired by Berkeley. You know, I'm a conservative professor. They must have made a mistake. Um, uh, so I think I'm very fortunate to teach at Berkeley, you know, one of the great universities in the world. And so uh, if the price of it is, you know, sometimes some people get overly excited and leap up and can't contain themselves, I'm happy to pay that price in order to participate in this you know, this great American experiment. I think, uh, I think I'm damn lucky to be here, so I don't mind a little protest now and then. And are there things you would have done differently at the Justice Department in hindsight? I don't think so. I, I would have... <laughs> it's a fair question. No, no, no. I, 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 I've thought about that a I'm lot, sure. but I think... Um, uh, you know, I was in this position in the government. We had just been attacked on 9-11, and I was asked uh, questions I never thought I would be asked. And I, I, those are the most difficult questions people in government have ever had to face, I think. Uh, also, on the other hand, I thought it was my duty. I, had to, I was given that job so that I had a duty to answer them as best I could. And so I tried to, uh, so I think I, re I reached the judgment that I thought, made the best sense of, of the law at the time. Um, the other thing one could do is resign. Right. right. I mean, if you really, uh, if you disagreed with what the government has done, uh, you know, but I will notice a lot, I will note a lot of our critics, a lot of the critics of the Bush administration served in the Obama administration and they didn't close Guantanamo and they, they ramped up the use of drones and I didn't see a lot of people resigning from office. Fair answer. Okay. Well, thank you. Our thanks to John Yu for joining us this evening. Thanks. We want to remind everyone that copies of John Yu's new book are available for sale, and he'll be happy to sign them at the back of the room right after the program. We appreciate your letting him make his way to the signing table as quickly as possible. I'm Quentin Hardy, head of editorial at Google Cloud, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.